we need to be watching. And the question I have for you is, are you watching? Today we have the privilege to have Morgan Jackson as our uh, guest speaker today. Morgan is the Senior Vice President of Faith Comes by Hearing, one of our ministry partners. And Faith Comes by Hearing um, specializes in translating the Bible into audio format, and they have a vision for um, having the Bible translated um, into every language um, throughout the world by 2033. And so uh, we're excited that Morgan could join us today. So if you would, please join me in giving Morgan, Morgan a great Union Church welcome. It's nice to be back in Hong Kong. I've been trying to get here for three years and you guys have kept me out. And then even when I got here, you locked me up at the Conrad Hotel because I tested positive as I went through the, uh, the airport. So I was two weeks in Asia and the last place was Vietnam and evidently somebody was too friendly and um, helped me out. So we had a, a wonderful event. I don't know if you know, but you have given us missionaries from our church, your church, to help Faith Comes by Hearing. Aaron Tan and Linda, or Aaron is our chairman of our board. He's my boss. So if you have any problem with me, don't talk to him, talk to me. So anyways, we had a wonderful event at the Conrad Hotel and I was 41 floors above and unable to attend and having to do everything by Zoom. So I am so happy to be able to actually see you guys in present, in the flesh, and to be able to speak. Union Church, welcomed me when I first came 11 years ago, and you have always been one of our supporting churches, both with the One Campaign and just getting God's word around the nation. Uh, you have also have many members here that support us, and so I wanna say thank you. Um, I think some, most of you know what we do, but just to be sure, as you know, Faith Comes by Hearing started by my parents 50 years ago. I've been serving my mother and father for 40 years. Uh, my dad is 87, my mom is 88. My dad still comes into the office every day. He sends his greetings several years ago. He came and spoke for the first time in a church outside of the United States and it was at the Union Church. And so he was very honored to be with you. We recorded the Bible in the United States for Americans because 80 plus percent of American Christians were not reading the Bible. And my father loved the Word of God and he kept reading that faith comes by hearing. So he said, well, if they won't read it, maybe they'll listen to it. And they did. So we worked with 137,000 churches, got 4 million families in scripture. And then Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Bible Societies began to come to us in the late 80s and saying, why are you doing this for Americans who can read? Uh, the Wycliffe people would say, you know, we translate the Bible and we may have three or 400,000 people and only 20 of them can read. And Haiti, the Bible Society said, 90% of the people are illiterate. Now around the world, 50% of the world's population is functionally illiterate. 70% live in oral cultures. So they were telling us that they would distribute Bibles and they say we would come back and the Bibles would be missing all the pages. And we would say, hey, what happened to the pages in the Bible? And they said, well, pastor, you said that man cannot live by bread alone. We can't read. So every day we just tear one of the pages out of the Bible and we put it in the soup and we eat it. Hmm. In Nigeria, they tell us that when they build a house, because they've heard the preacher say, if you build your house on the word of God, it won't fall, they buy four Bibles, and when they pour the cement, they put a Bible in each corner. <laughs> so around the world, people are eating Bibles, they're sleeping on Bibles, they're hanging Bibles to ward away evil spirits because they can't read the word of God. So what we do is we take that text we have 50 teams around the world, national teams. They go into the village. They bring a generator. They convert a mud hut into a studio. They take 25 narrators 
and they do a drama recording of the New Testament. We add sound effects and music, and then when it's done, we put it on a device like this, which we call a proclaimer. It's made out of the material you make a football helmet. The batteries can be recharged 3,000 times, which means you can hear the whole New Testament a thousand times. I tell people, if you do that, you can go straight to heaven. Just go there. If you don't, the Africans love it because it drinks the sun. So that recharges from solar. If you don't see the sun, you can crank it for 10 minutes and it recharges it well enough that you can li listen for 40. It's loud enough that a thousand people can hear it. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. John 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. So it's drama, and in oral cultures, because they're communal, and you have to remember, God's word was actually never meant to be read. It was always heard in community, when we bring it the way it has always been traditionally heard, we bring it to the village or the church, and the whole village or church gathers to hear. And I love how people react. Some of them will start laughing, and they'll say, I didn't know Jesus was Swahili. And I say, he's not Swahili. And they say, yes, he is. And I say, he's not. And they say, yes. And I say, why do you say that? And they say, listen, he speaks perfect Swahili. <laughs> right? And so what we find is that as people hear God's word, it transforms them. Now, you don't realize it, but you and I are living in historic times. We've experienced the greatest revival in the history of the world in the last hundred years. In Africa, there was only 5% Christian in 1901. Today, over 50% of sub-Saharan Africa claims to be Christ. And we see that happening around the world. Now, as we've seen this great revival, we're also seeing what Matthew 24 talks about, right? Wars, rumors of wars. So the disciples were asking Jesus, what will be the sign of the destruction of the temple? What will be the signs of your return? And Jesus says there's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of war. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilence. Now, we're all experiencing that, right? And he said, but the end is not yet. Because the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 24, 14 says the gospel of the kingdom must be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to every nation. And the word nation there is ethnos, which means language, tribe, or people. Then the end will come. Now, that's an interesting statement. We actually know when the end will come. When every language or nation is reached. So about eight years ago, 10 years ago, a group called Illuminations began to gather the 11 top Bible translation agencies, and the business leaders were the ones that gathered them. And, and I like business leaders because in the missions world, we always talk about when we're going to begin. But business people always want to know, when is the job going to be done? When can I move in? Not when you're going to start the house. When is it going to be done? And so they've been gathering these all of us together saying, when can we get it done? And so the Bible translation groups came together and they brought us in and they said, we believe by the year 2033, 2000 years after the death of Christ, we could see translation in every single language of the world. Now that's important because of Matthew 24, 14. Now it says that when we see these signs, we need to be looking we need to be watching. And a question I have for you is, are you watching? Are you actually looking for Christ's return? So if you would take a moment, I would actually like you to bow your heads. And I'd like you to take a moment and search your heart honestly and say to your, and look at yourself. Are, am I looking for the return of Christ? So go ahead and bow your head for a moment.
Amen. Now, if you are not, I would ask that over the weeks to come, you would begin to look at yourself and begin to start looking because Christ is at the door. It's coming soon. Now, there's two stories that had a, 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 a huge impact on me this year. One was one of our translation partners finished a translation in northern Tanzania, East Africa. And George, who was one of the translators, with the team went up into the villages to allow people to hear the word of God. George, in one of the villages, looked and saw an old man. He went over and sat beside him, realizing he was blind, began to talk to him. The best they can figure, he was about 94 years of age, and he had been born blind. So George tells him, he says, we've translated the Bible into our language. Would you like to hear the story of the Son of God, Jesus Christ? And the old man said, I've never heard about the Son of God, of Jesus Christ. Yes, I would like to hear the story. And so as they listened, they started with Mark. And as the old man listened to Mark, after some time, he turned to George and he said, I would like to follow this Jesus. How do I do that? And he said, well, you know, so George explained repentance. You have to confess your sin. The acceptance of Christ, born again, inviting him to be your Lord and Savior. And he said, you just pray and repent and invite Jesus in. And, and George said, I've, the old man said to George, I've never prayed before. I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? And so George led him in a simple sinner's prayer, inviting Christ to come into his life. And as the old man finished praying, he looked up at George and he said, I can see. While you were praying, I received my sight. There was this excitement. The old man later on said to George, I have never seen a sunrise. Would you come tomorrow and be with me to watch my first sunrise? And so George agreed, came the following day. And as the sun rose, the old man wept, watching the sun. And he began to tell George, he said, last night I had a dream. And in my dream, he said, I saw this huge door to heaven open. And he said, I, I thought to myself, did that door to heaven open because of the prayer I prayed with George yesterday? And George said, yes, that's what happened. The old man was happy. George came back the following day to find that the old man had died in the night. People are waiting. They haven't rejected Jesus. They have never heard of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Obomanobo people living in the Philippines on one of the islands are like that. 70,000 people. It's taken 70 years to translate the New Testament for them. 70 years. And finally, they've received it recently. It's just that nobody could read it. So we recorded it with Wycliffe, the translators, and we began to send the Word of God back into the churches. Not very many churches. There's a few churches. Only 5% are Christian. The Obomanobo people are despised people. The Cebuano people are the majority language people. They make fun of them because they worship the, the rivers, the trees. Uh, they speak with an accent. They're poor. They're subsistence farmers. They live up and in the mountain communities. But something is happening in the Obomanobo people. They themselves despise themselves. They themselves did not want to be Obomanobo. When they come down to the, the cities, they try to hide their ethnicity. They try to hide, but they can't. They have an accent. They're dark from the sun. Well, as the people have begun to listen to the Obomanobo, God has begun to transform them. See, even the Christians, they preach in Cebuano in the churches. Nobody understands. Even the Christians have idols in their home that they offer sacrifices to. The first time they hear the Oban Manobo, they hear where Jesus is confronting the devil. The devil is tempting him, saying, if you will worship me, I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus says to him, get 
away from me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And in that moment, they're terrified, and they run back, take their idols out of their house, and destroy them. Now, as they listen, I ask the Obamanovo people, what stories or scriptures have caused you to come to faith? And they told me it was the story of the ten virgins. Now, you know, for, I don't see that as a salvation story, so I'm like, I don't understand. Why, why that story? And one of the men began to explain to me, he said, the word in obo Manobo for the foolish uh, virgins is, is bonge. And he said, that word is so expressive in our language. It means you're so stupid, you're so foolish, you're so dumb, you're such an idiot. He said, nobody would want to be called bonge. And he said, to be bonge is just so horrible. And he said, I was bonge. I did not and was not ready for Christ. And so I repented. And it caused me to start thinking to myself, I'm looking for Christ's return. But all ten virgins were looking. Only five were ready. Five were not ready. And so I feel like the Lord wants me to ask you that question. I want you to bow your head again. And I want you to look in your heart and say, Am I looking for Christ's return? And am I actually ready? If he came today, am I ready? So bow your head and take a moment. Search your heart. Are you ready? Amen. I hope that you found that you weren't. But if you are not, now is the time to begin to repent. Now is the time to start looking at your life and changing who you are and what you do so that you're ready when Christ returns. Now, the Bongi people despise themselves. And so when they came to 1 Timothy, they told me that when Jesus talks about you were not a people, but have now been chosen a priest, I've chosen you to be a holy people, a priest people, you who had not received mercy have received mercy, who you who were in darkness, I have now brought you into the light. You who are not a people are a people. Now, they didn't want a people. They did not want to exist anymore. They wanted to be Sabuano. Now they're saying, hey, but Jesus chose us to be a people. Then they said when they heard Revelation 5, where the people are weeping, and John's weeping because nobody's found worthy to open the scroll. And then they said, wait, wait, wait. But the lion, the tribe of, of the tribe of Judah, he who was slain, a lamb came looking as if it was slain, and it says, you are worthy to open the scroll. Per, per, by your blood, you have purchased men for God from every language, tribe, nation, and people. And they, it hit them because they're saying, he purchased us. Then in Revelation 7, it says that John was looking around the throne of God, and there was a massive multitude who nobody could count. People from every language, tribe, nation and people. And at that moment, the Bongis say, the Bongis are supposed to be there. Every tribe, every language, every people. If the Bongi, or not the Bongi, the Obomonobo people are not there, then we are not going to be represented. The Obomonobo language, the people, the tribe must be there under the throne. A teacher told me that she had stopped teaching her youngest son, Obomonobo. Didn't teach it because she didn't want him to have an accent in Cebuano. The older children spoke it. But as the household began to listen to Oban Monobo, the word of God had such a deep impact on them that the young boy became angry at the mother saying, everybody understands the Bible but me because I don't know my language. I don't know Oban Monobo. You must teach me. And she has begun to teach him the language. I spoke to an old woman and she talked to me about how her and her husband her children and her grandchildren lived in this place of fear and anger and darkness and drunkenness and, 
and abuse and how when the word of God came in Obamanobo, they repented and peace has come. And she told me how powerful it was to pray in Obamanobo and how God answered their prayers, whereas in Cebuano, God didn't answer their prayers. But Obamanobo, he did. She said, we only fight now over the proclaimer. Who gets to listen? The neighbors want to listen. The grandchildren want to listen. And then she began to sob and she began to weep. And I asked her, I said, what's wrong? And she said, somebody has stolen our proclaimer. And she just looked at me and she says, and she just tearing. She says, how do we live without God's word? How do we live without the Word of God? All of them were illiterate. And I looked at her and I went, I don't know. I don't know how I would live without God's Word. 1.5 billion people in the world today live without God's Word. Just like the old man have never heard of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. For the old woman, I was able to tell our staff, because you guys give to me, find her another proclaimer. And she and her family will once again have God's word. Over the next 11 years, we're inviting you, you personally and the church, to join us in the journey of translating the word of God orally for every one of the last language groups so that every single person in the world can have access to the Word of God. Now, we all know this technology right now allows me in this room, I can listen to any one of the 1,705 languages we've recorded. 6.6 .6 billion people have scripture in their language. I can listen to any one of them. 1,200 videos of the gospel I have here. This room is full, it's covered with the Word of God. There will be a day in 11 years where we will have every language and the earth, there will be no place on earth where you cannot have access to God's Word in your language. So when the scriptures in Habakkuk says that the whole earth, not might, will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. So not only will every language, nation, person be hearing God's word, but the earth will be covered. I have a funny question that hit me a while back. My dad asked the question, what was the language that Adam and Eve spoke in the Garden of Eden? Now everybody says Chinese, right? <laughs> the largest language in America, we believe it's English. But actually, there was only one language. It was the language of God, right? And so when you come to the Tower of Babel, it's like there was a great marble ball, and that ball was God's language. And God took the language, and he <laughs> broke it. The Chinese got a big piece of God's language. English got a good piece. The Obomanobo got a small piece. But God has never fought, forgot how to speak his language. Obamanovo is a piece of God's language. And we are translating the word of God into the piece of God's language they speak. And I just believe that when we come all together under the throne of God, every language, every tribe, every people, it will take all of the languages of the world together to represent the fullness of the language of God. So we welcome you all in this journey towards Vision 2033. And I would ask that you would take serious time. Are you looking? And are you ready? Amen.